Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to the lab. In this video, I'm gonna be giving you a crash course into CloudSeed, which is the full stack F Sharp and Svelte Kit boilerplate that I use for basically all of my products. So in this video, uh, we're first gonna be going over uh, why there's even a boilerplate, what problem is it trying to solve, how is it trying to solve it. Um, then we're gonna go into the CloudSeed architecture. So what do you actually get with the, the boilerplate? Uh, why is it useful, things like that. And then finally, we're gonna end off with how to actually spin up CloudSeed, which hopefully shows you just how easy it is to get started um, and why this might be of use to you. So first, why boilerplate? Why am I even talking about CloudSeed? Well, the basic problem that CloudSeed tries to solve is that it takes a lot of time to spin up an app. Now, over the years, uh, I've tried to spin up lots of different products, lots of different businesses, I'm basically coding it all myself. And what I found is that when you're trying to build an app or a product or a business, um, a lot of the time you're working on stuff that is not really your product, but is required to actually have your product up and running. So in the case of, let's say you're building an app that tries to track like running or something like that, um, basically anything that's not tracking the running or uh, giving you an analytics about the running or letting you see like your friends doing running, anything that's not related to the business, I consider is kind of non-app work. And when you try to spin something up from scratch, there's a lot of this stuff that is required to actually allow you to do the app work. And so some common examples of this that I've seen in my practice and you know around the communities I've been involved in um, are things like choosing the actual technology. So what front end uh, framework are you using? What back end framework are you using? What library are you using? Uh, for this specific use case. Leads to analysis paralysis, and then you don't actually get anything done. Um, the next big one is actually core plumbing. So let's say you know what technologies you're gonna use, um, actually setting them up so that you can use them. So these are uh, things like integrating with your database of choice, uh, maybe integrating with the cloud of choice that you choose to host on, uh, getting your testing up and running, uh, making sure that you can test against you know fake databases, um, making sure that your configuration system works, uh, that it works for different environments, um, making sure that you can containerize this for deploy or, or is using the right libraries to actually deploy. So all these things are things that kind of go into building an app that you can host somewhere and that the public can, can you know, talk to, but is like not actually the business. It's not actually, you know, allowing you to build a running app product, um, but it's still required for that to actually work. And so that's where CloudSeed comes into play. Um, I tried to ship a lot of businesses. I kept running into this issue and I was like, there has to be a way to get rid of this duplicated work. And that's why I came up with a boilerplate. So that's CloudSeed. Um, basically what it's trying to do is provide the paved road for 95% of projects. Paved road being something that you just kind of start with and it makes it easy to continue on your merry way. And so the way that it tries to approach this problem, the kind of values it brings to the table to, to solve this, um, are listed here. So the first is that it wants to be really simple. So uh, in my experience, the best software is simple software. And the reason that is, is because it's easy to reason about. And this means that it's much easier to maintain. It's much easier to modify. It's much easier to delete um, and change out uh, for something that does the same or better. So the whole idea is that it really needs to be as simple as possible so that it can work for basically any project and that any developer can easily get started with it. The next value it has is to be reliable. And the way that we're approaching this is to just use like boring and battle-tested technology. So uh, I think probably the front-end landscape is the best counter example of this where um, you know new frameworks are coming out all the time, multiple a year, and then very few of them last two years, very, very few of them last five years. And so we are basically trying to make bets on the technologies that have a really good track record of being reliable, that people love, um, that we believe will be around for, you know, the next decade or more. Um, so you don't really have to worry about this. You don't have to worry about building your stuff on a bad foundation. And the last kind of value it brings to the table is that it wants your core system to be powerful. Um, and so we don't want you to build into an ecosystem where there's no support. We don't want you to build into an ecosystem where if you actually become successful, you're, you have to rewrite everything. Ideally, this is something that if you have growing problems, you know, the best kinds of problems, it gracefully helps you scale to the next level. And so hopefully that gives you some context of like what we're trying to solve with Boilerplate and how CloudSeed tries to approach this. And I think this is a good segue into what actually CloudSeed comes with, what it consists of, um, so you can see how it's solving that problem. 
So let's go into Cloud Seed architecture as well as all the kind of technologies that it, it comes with uh, to help you get started. So here is a high level of the architecture. Um, pretty basic, and this is what I use for basically all of my products nowadays. Um, if you've done system design interviews before, if you you know have spun up your own businesses, um, it should be pretty simple to see how most businesses fall into this formula with their tech stack. This is like the bare minimum that you need to get started, but also scales really, really well. And so basically what it is, is split up into three different, oops, sorry, um, three different parts of the architecture. Uh, it's got a backend, which is kind of where the core logic is gonna happen. Uh, it's got a front end so that users can actually interact with it. And then it's got a persistence layer, which is mostly so you can do end-to-end -end testing. And each of these are dockerized um, into containers. Uh, which makes it really easy to run this anywhere, whether it's local or hosted somewhere, uh, bare metal, et cetera, but also really easy to compose. So if you think about like the uh, principles of the 12-factor app where you want basically reliable software to be easy to spin down or spin up and auto scale and stuff like that, Containers gives us that out of the box. So it's really, really great to have this kind of not just conceptual boundary, but also literal physical boundary to help us accomplish that. And then to help with the composability, especially locally, but you could do this um, hosting as well, is we're using Docker Compose, which is Docker's basically official answer to composability of multiple containers. And so for the rest of this section, what I'm going to do is going to go through each of these um, layers one by one to kind of talk about what the role is in this boilerplate and kind of how we're thinking about um, the scaling and being really easy to run for any app the 95% of apps, which I think will help when we get to the demo section. Um, so you kind of know what we're actually running. So let's start with the backend. Um, the reason I start with the backend is basically this is the core part and value of the boilerplate and this app. So the way that I look at it, the backend is the core value provider of any system or architecture because you need the business logic to exist somewhere. And typically if you have an app or product that scales um, enough, it's going to have multiple different kinds of front ends, maybe a web front end, maybe uh, Apple front end, maybe a VR front end, maybe an Android front end. Um, and so if you really want to get the most bang for your buck out of your service, it's to kind of have your general business logic where your you know product actually does centered in a back end, and then you just have a bunch of front ends that kind of call into it. This is super scalable. This is how like every architecture on earth basically works. And so that's why I think I am reasonable in saying this and stating this. Now, the technologies we basically use for this is F Sharp, which runs on .NET. Um, people might think this is weird. Uh, when you think of .NET, most people think of C Sharp because that's kind of what made it famous. Um, but recently I've started up with F Sharp and it's basically the best language I've ever found. Um, and it's, I would argue it's C Sharp, but better, better type system, more ergonomic, uh, functional first. Um, we don't have time in this video to go through all of that, but that's why this is F Sharp. Now, the core technologies that we're using here, and I've talked about this in the past as breakdowns of some of the apps and services I've shipped um, this year, and I'll have a link down below or, or up above that you can click to learn more about this, is the technology breakdown um, for building a robust uh, minimal web server. And so the language, again, is F Sharp. Uh, for the web server, we're using Giraffe on ASP.NET. This gives us the power of .NET, but also gives us a bunch of functional bindings to make sure that you know we're really leaning into the, the functional style of F Sharp. Um, for the data layer, because you need something to actually you know, talk to your uh, database, we're using Dapper for the ORM. Um, this is really flexible, like basically the simplest thing uh, that you can use. And it is super performant, scales really well. And then for migrations, we're using DBUp, which is again, the simplest like migrations thing that we have. Um, these are really great for relational. And since it's an ORM, since it's a really simple migration, should be easy to swap out if you're using a different paradigm like a NoSQL or document store or something like that. Um, finally, for testing, uh, most apps probably need some sort of testing. We're using XUnit, which is Microsoft's like go-to official solution right now, and then FSUnit on top of it, which just gives us functional bindings. So again, we can lean into uh, the functional first style of F Sharp. And the hope is with this, you basically have a front end that can scale or a back end that can scale really, really well with your business logic or your performance or kind of any workload that you need to throw at this thing. And of course, if you need something specific, you've got the entire .NET ecosystem of libraries through NuGet or Packet or whatever you want to use um, at your disposal. So that is the backend and that really is the core 
value proposition of this boilerplate. Now a little bit of tangential, but if you haven't used F# -sharp before, if you want to see what an F# -sharp Docker file even looks like, um, check out this video. We kind of go into it more here, and that might be a good place for you to kind of get started with that. Now the next part of the architecture I want to talk about is the front end. And so I kind of already told you my philosophy about back ends and front ends. Back end is like basically all the business logic, and front end is more of just a way to access that. And so here we do that same thing. This front end is basically just a lean front end. I'd almost even call it anemic because it's so lean. Um, that's really built to be extended upon if you want or completely replaced if you don't like the technology choices we have or you're opinionated about this or, or whatever. And so what we've given you here is a default choice that we think can work with, again, 95% of projects, but if you don't like it, really easy to remove and compose because we have this composable architecture. And so here the technology we've chosen are SvelteKit with TypeScript. The Svelte and SvelteKit is the easiest way I've found to do front end um, in my years as software engineering. Uh, and TypeScript, because if you're using dynamic today, like it just why, uh, static typing is the only type of programming language that, that scales, so use static typing, please. For styling, we're using Tailwind, um, which developers tend to love, most people tend to use. Um, and so we wanted to get you started with that, but again, easy to bring your own uh, libraries, use NPM. And then the next thing that we find in most products people will need is some sort of like content, whether it's your sales page or a blog or documentation, anything like that. Um, and so we're providing a markdown because we don't want you to get locked into any ecosystem we're using. We don't want you writing Svelte files if you decide to use React. Um, markdown is basically the answer to that. And so we're just providing out of the box an easy way to convert those markdown to um, Svelte which again, could just be plugged into whatever you decide to choose. So hopefully that makes sense for just, you know, the simplest thing you can do to get started with front end um, and scale if you want, but also just replace if you don't need it. Now I kind of went into this a little bit, um, but it's way out of scope for this video. Uh, I used to use React and Next.js and that used to be what um, was in CloudSeed, but I basically found that SvelteKit is much easier to use, much simpler to use, much, I won't say more powerful, but easier to create something powerful. And so for more on that, um, you can check out my thoughts on Svelte is better than React. There's a link here, and then I also have it uh, below in the description, along with all the links I kind of mentioned here today. Okay, so finally we get to persistence. Um, and, you know, we have a database, uh, comes with Postgres um, in a container. And you're probably thinking like, well, this isn't something I deploy. And yeah, you probably wouldn't deploy this to prod. Um, you know, your database probably needs to be more persistent than, than just in a container that you spin up and down. That said, um, the reason we're providing this is because I found that most development works better if you can develop in such a way that it actually mirrors the real environment that you're in. And so when you start developing, usually you're gonna start locally and then you're later gonna go to, to prod. And one of the hardest things is if your development environment does not reasonably represent what the production environment is, then you're gonna do a lot of debugging to try and solve that. And so we're trying to skip that entire debug step. We're gonna give you um, basically an easy way to spin up the entire architecture locally so that it runs hopefully just like it would in prod um, so you can find these bugs faster and hopefully develop and ship faster. And so here we're giving you a container with Postgres, but because it's a container and very easy to compose, you could very easily swap it out with a relational database with very few changes to the code and ORM. And even if you wanted to go to a different kind of paradigm, like a document store or something, just swap out the ORM um, and you can just still compose it with the container. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, you know, we're providing you a fully composable, fully containerized uh, three-tier architecture, which works for 95% of products and apps and should be pretty easy to configure for uh, whatever the percentage is if you're doing something a little bit weird. Okay, so for the part you've all been waiting for, um, we should now understand kind of what problem we're trying to solve with this boilerplate, um, what the Cloud Seed boilerplate provides. And in this section, I'm gonna try to show you how easy it is to uh, get Cloud Seed and to actually spin up this whole three-tier architecture locally. And so before I do this, um, first I wanted to you know, make sure you understand the requirements to actually go through this successfully. Um, and basically what you're gonna need is Docker and Docker Compose. Docker because the containers that we are spinning up each of these um, layers in is running Docker containers. And then Docker Compose because that's what we're actually using to spin up these uh, multiple containers at once. 
So installing this is outside the scope of the video, but if you just Google this, it um, should be really easy to uh, install on whatever your operating system is in just a few minutes. Okay, so enough talk about what Cloud Seed is. Now let's go and actually run it. So uh, basically to get started with Cloud Seed, there's only two steps. Um, first, you're gonna clone the Cloud Seed repo, and then you're just gonna run the Docker Compose. And so uh, you can get access to the Cloud Seed repo and a link to that um, at cloudseed.xyz. And the latest documentation including all these commands I'm showing you here, if you wanna copy and paste it, is again available at the website, cloudseed.xyz in the documentation section. I have a link down below, and then I'll also have it um, in the description uh, to get that. So, so you're gonna clone that repo so that you actually have it on your machine, and then we're gonna run Docker Compose. Um, so here's the command line uh, command if you wanna run it this way. Um, and basically what it's doing is we're saying remove any containers that we've already been running, uh, delete them um, if we need to, so we don't have any kind of stragglers. Then we're going to build new images of these containers so that we can capture any new code that we've written, any changes we've done. We have a fresh kind of build for that. And then finally, what we're gonna do is, once we have those new images, we're actually gonna run it. And this is how we're gonna be able to access our code uh, locally and have it being like served via an API endpoint. Now, if you're using VS Code, again, we're trying to give you the, the paved road for 95% of projects, um, you can just run this in a task. And basically, this launch compose task is just calling directly into this command line, but hopefully this uh, makes it so that you don't have to copy and paste so much. Again, if you want this command, um, it is available in the documentation, so uh, click the link below for that. So now let's show you what this looks like. Okay, so basically what I'm showing you here is my VS Code editor opened up into Cloud Seed Base, which is this Cloud Seed boilerplate. And so here on the left, you'll see the main folders that it comes with. Now the names are a little bit different than the ones I've been using here, um, but they're a little bit more descriptive. So the back end is the app. Um, we've got all the tests and app.tests. Uh, development database is the persistence layer that I was talking about. And then web is the front end that uh, we mentioned earlier. Uh, why are they different names? Well, because these are a little bit more specific and for instance web is telling you it's actually a web front end not just like you know an android front end or an ios front end um, so that's why these are named different but they're basically all the same uh exactly what i just uh walked through in the rest of the video and what you'll notice is that you know here at the base level we've got this docker compose here which is how we're actually going to pose everything together we've got a docker compose for testing um which gives you a paved road for doing those tests and then in each of these folders um, for each of these services uh, they've each got um versions of Docker files to help us get up and running. So now let's run this. Now I'm using VS Code, and again, I'm trying to make the paved road, so I'm just going to use the VS Code task. Um, so I'm just going to open up this little command prompt thing, uh, go to run task, and then run that launch compose task. And what we should see is that it's going to spin down, you know, any of these um, containers that exist. It's going to rebuild these containers from uh, their folders, and then it's going to try and run these folders on my computer. And so here we can see console output from um, each of these services. And so theoretically, this works. But as I always like to tell you, um, you shouldn't take my word for it. I'm just a random software engineer on the internet. Uh, really what we need to do is validate that what we've done actually does what we think it's done. And so I've tried to make this really easy with Cloud Seed to give you a few basic examples of how APIs might work, um, how you might structure some of your apps to give you a jumping off point. And also so that you can sanity check because I think sanity checking is really useful uh, for making sure your code does what it says it does. Um, and so here is where we expect our apps to be running. This is by default. You can obviously configure this um, if you want to use different ports or something, but by default, our front end service is gonna be running on localhost 5000, our back end is at 5001, and our persistence at 5002. And I've tried to provide some very simple functionality so you can just test that these are all working together. And so we're gonna start with the front end, which basically um, is a click counter, which again, I've talked about in another video of how this actually works, uh, which I'll have linked below. That basically is gonna test that the front end can talk to the back end, which is gonna to talk to the persistence. And I'll show you how this works. So I'm now in my browser um, at localhost 5000, and what I'm gonna do is just reload so that you kind of know um, that this is actually running on my computer. And this is what the base um, website looks like. And the way that we're gonna verify is we're just gonna hit this smash button. 
And if you've seen Smash the Button, this is you know the exact same thing. Basically, it's a counter. What we're doing is we're sending a HTTP request to the backend. Backend is going to um, process that, is going to save something to the, the database, and then uh, we're going to get back you know whatever the total of the counter is. It double counts a little bit, so don't worry that this you know might jump around a little bit. Um, but the important thing is if we refresh this, we expect this to be non-zero. And the reason we need to make sure that it's non-zero is to see if the persistence actually saved that counter off. And it did, so it looks like this full thing works. But you know, if something isn't working as expected, we wanna provide some ways to kind of do a binary search. And so what we're gonna do is uh, give you a way to just touch the backend. And so what we've provided is at Locos 5001, where the backend is a Sentinels um, endpoint, which is basically a health endpoint. And every time we hit this, what it's gonna do is gonna create a new record, and then it's just gonna return 10 records here. Um, so as we see, every time we hit it, it's updating and it's returning back the, the 10 that, that we see here. And so this seems to be working uh, with the backend to the persistence. And so we have validated basically all of them. Now, of course, if you want to hit um, your database for any reason, uh, that is configured to be 5002, but we don't really need to validate that because each of these validated them implicitly. And that's it. Uh, that's the crash course into CloudSeed, you know, the full stack F-sharp Svelte kit um, boilerplate that I use for basically developing and launching each of my products and apps as fast as I can. Uh, if you want to learn more or get access to the boilerplate, head over to cloudseed.xyz for that. It's got more documentation, more instructions, um, and more info about what you're, all, you're getting and how to get it. And... Let me know if you have any questions. Um, if you have any questions about Cloud Seed or building with F-sharp, uh, SvelteKit, um, containerizing Postgres, anything like that, let me know. Um, basically, your feedback here helps me decide what I'm going to dive into next. So until then, um, you can follow me here, and I will see you in the next one.